Many years ago, it was customary for men in all walks of life to support their families. But today's conditions are entirely changed. Today, thousands of women are obliged to support themselves and their families. Today, women sorely need the kind of help to discharge their duties and obligations to their families, which the Equal Rights Amendment could so easily afford. It has actually come to pass that the equal rights provision in the Constitution of Japan, enacted a few years ago, enables the Japanese women to enjoy advantages and opportunities which are denied the women of the United States. Finally, gentlemen of the Judiciary Committee, when you consider the Equal Rights Amendment this new year, I appeal to you in the name of justice to make a favorable report. 1913. Yes, it was all white and we looked so beautiful with our banners and our parasols and our signs, the horse in the hit front of the parade and it was all very lovely but it it was a very tumultuous day. The first sign that there would be a problem was that the National Association of Women's Suffrage didn't want the colored women to march in the parade. They were still trying to placate the white women of the South who had no intention of granting Negro women or men the vote. Well, I have to tell you, my good friend Ida B. Wells Barnett was having none of it. I acquiesced because I thought the most important thing was for us to be present and to be seen. And so I, along with the Delta sorority in Washington at Howard University, agreed to march at the end of the parade. That was the compromise that we came to, but not Ida. Ida was not one to compromise. Ida said if we give in to this ridiculous notion that the races have one that is inferior and one superior, then what is the point of the battle? And so she stood on the sideline, and as the Illinois delegation came marching by, she stepped out with her white sisters in the suffrage movement and marched in the middle of the march, as well we should have all done, now that I think about it in retrospect. But ladies or no ladies, white or colored, the men who had gathered on both sides of the street to observe our parade did not treat us as ladies. No, they harassed us, they threw things, they disrupted the course of the parade, and finally, because the police had been ignoring these hooligans the entire time and allowing them to harass us, oh, and mercilessly we were harassed, Finally, they started to arrest people, but not before women were injured, bodily injured. I'm fortunate maybe that since we were at the end of the parade, we were not hurt. But women were hurt and knocked to the ground and ridiculed. And the good thing, though, is that some of the men who were in the crowd realized just what a spectacle these men were making of themselves when we were just exercising our right to free speech and having a parade to advocate for our beliefs and had done nothing wrong. And eventually the chief of police was fired because he mishandled that by allowing the police to not interfere with the violence that was being set upon us. We have the vote now, but it was a long, long struggle. And it was one that took a great deal of courage. I moved from Ohio to Washington, D.C., and when I moved there, one of the first things I did was start to attend meetings that were held by suffragists. Every two years, there would be a convention in Washington, and I always attended. There would be speakers from all over the country and sometimes all over the world 
who were making it known that women deserve to have the right to vote in a country that proclaimed in its constitution that all men were created equal and seemed to have taken the word men and turned it on its head to mean anyone that wasn't born female or anyone who took the trouble not to be born black. No, that is not what all men created equal in spirit was supposed to mean. So I would attend these meetings and such amazing, hardworking women who I'd heard of because of their work in the abolitionist movement, now turning their attention to getting the right to vote for women. Women like Lucretia Mott, the Quaker, and Susan B. Anthony, and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, just to name a few. Oh, I was just reading one of my good friends, Mr. H.G. Wells, the author's books. Uh, he has agreed to write the introduction to my autobiography, which I'm working on now. I've decided to call it A Colored Woman in a White World. He said that that title might be a little bit too offsetting, but that is a common problem we face as a race. People are so unaccustomed to us being honest about our situation that when we are, they accuse us of complaining. But the truth is the truth. And as a colored woman in a white world, I have a story that I believe needs to be told. For instance, as a colored woman in the capital of the United States, Washington, DC, my rights are not respected. There are places that I can't go. I could walk the streets of Washington for hours and not find a restaurant where I could sit down and just have a simple glass of water or a cup of coffee. That is why I do the work I do. I can't remember a time in my life when I didn't realize that first of all, I was very, very fortunate. And second of all, that there was a challenge put before me to disprove all the heinous lies that were told about my people, that we were inferior, that we were second-class citizens. No, I resolved in my mind from the time I was sent away to boarding school in Ohio from my home in Memphis, Tennessee by my parents, that I was going to do my utmost to always be an example of the excellence that made me a colored woman, that I would never be ashamed of the African blood in my veins, that I would never speak against my race, and that I would always uphold the dignity of the colored woman. As I said as a child, even though I was born in the South, and actually because I was born in the South, I was born one year and one day after the Emancipation Proclamation was signed by Abraham Lincoln, September 23rd, 1863. Both of my parents were former slaves, but because they were educated and able to make a living for themselves, I lived a life of relative luxury and comfort. We owned our own home, my mother had her own business and my father was a businessman as well. And because they were educated, they saw how little by little there in Tennessee and throughout the South, even though slavery had ended, the effort to suppress the colored race and resubjugate them was present everywhere, especially in their case, in, in their imp important to them was the fact that education was very lacking for children of our race at that time. And that's why they sent me to Antioch College in Yellow Springs, Ohio. I suppose you think, oh, poor little girl, she was sent away at such a young age, for I was only six years old when I went away. But I understood that it was for a higher purpose. 
and I didn't allow myself to feel sorry for myself. No, I applied myself to my studies and I stayed with a wonderful family who made me feel like I was one of their own. Because I worked so diligently and because the opportunity was not denied me to explore academics, science, music, and all the things that make a cultured, well-rounded, educated person, I was able to attend, at that time, the only college in the United States that would admit colored people or women. And being both, Oberlin College was where I wanted to be. I also knew that I wasn't going to let sex constrain me in my studies in college after so much hard work, so I didn't take the ladies course. I took the gentlemen's course, which meant I had to study the rigorous classes of mathematics, science, history, Latin, Greek, and literature. I excelled at these things and was the editor of the Oberlin Review when I was a student there and I graduated in 1884. Like I said, <laughs> after that, when I moved back to the South and was living at home with my father, my parents had divorced and my father wanted me to be the lady of the home. He was a Southerner and ladies didn't work. Ladies were hostesses and because he had achieved some measure, quite a measure of success, what a shame it would be for his daughter to have to go out and earn a living. No, that would have diminished my status in the eyes of the Southern Southerners who believed that ladies belonged at home in a gilded cage. But I knew the people of my race could not indulge that fantasy of what womanhood was. No, I was what they called a new woman. I wanted to use my education to better myself and to better others. And so most girls ran away from home to get married. I ran away from home to teach. I left without my father's permission and went to Wilberforce, Ohio to teach at Wilberforce College. The first college started for Negroes before the Civil War. At the end of the year, I wrote home a letter asking my father to forgive me and, and that I was coming home and that I hoped he would welcome me. Well. Imagine my relief when the train pulled into the station and there was my father in a carriage waiting to take me home. But I wasn't content being at home. You know, he remarried and there was no need for me to be the hostess, so I decided to move to Washington, D.C. and teach at the M Street High School, the high school for colored youth. Again, because I was a woman, I would not be allowed to marry and continue to teach. And at that time, it was considered if you were a teacher that you were resigned to being an old maid. Well, I hadn't thought about it one way or the other. I knew that I wanted to teach. I knew I wanted to encourage our young people because they were very discouraged because so many doors of opportunity were closed to them because of the color of their skin. Well, it was there at M Street High School that the principal, Mr. Robert Terrell, and I became friends. He was a brilliant man who had graduated from Howard College there in Washington and then was the first colored man to graduate from the law school of Harvard University in Massachusetts. I recall the first time the students began to tease us because they knew that we liked one another, even though we did our utmost to be professional. But we did marry. And he never, ever once tried to deter me from the work which was so important to me. Now, I thought once we were married that I would give up my civic work. I had been involved in different organizations, but someone who I admire even more than my husband that I met when I was at Oberlin College whom I think is the finest human being this country has ever produced, Mr. Frederick Douglass, the former slave who worked tirelessly his whole life for the uplift of our race. I ran into him in Washington because he was a resident of Anacostia, Maryland, and he told me, no, you have too much intelligence and too much passion 
for our people to simply keep house. You have to keep working. Years later, when I met his friend, Susan B. Anthony, I think of her words, agitate, agitate, agitate. That is what I've tried to do. There was never a time that the women of our race were not subjected to ridicule and criticism because it was assumed that we were less than ladies, less than intelligent, and less than deserving of opportunities to use our intelligence and our God-given gifts. That is what propelled me into working in the club women's movement. There were colored women all over the country who realized but now that we're out of slavery, those of us who can should be lifting as we climb. And so we formed organizations that created kindergartens and training schools for our young women and activities for our young men so that they would not be called into the streets because they were discouraged from all the doors that were closed to them. And then what really caused me to determine that my life should be spent advocating for my people was my dear friend Tom Moss in Memphis, Tennessee was lynched. Not because he had committed a crime, no, but because he had dared to be successful and ambitious and industrious. And that was something that the old guard mentality of the white southerner could not uphold. He was friends with my colleague Ida B. Wells too, and that propelled her as well into a life of journalism to, as she said, right the wrongs by shining the light of truth upon them. Now once I got involved with the club movement, it made absolute sense to work for the suffrage movement as well. I cannot recall a time that I did not believe to my core that women should have a say in the government which governs them. When I was at Oberlin, I wrote an essay entitled, Should the United States Have a 15th Amendment because at that time, a 16th Amendment because at that time we thought that the, the colored man getting the vote would be sufficient. It was not. And even if it was, to deny one half of the human race in this country the right to vote simply because we weren't clever enough to have ourselves be born men or cognizant enough to have ourselves born white, we should be denied a say in the government. It was preposterous. This is a country who cried out before the world and said that God had created every man equal. Who took it upon themselves to take the word men and mean not every single human being? It was a wrong that needed to be righted. I worked and advocated and spoke all over this country on behalf of my race and my sex through the National Association for Women's Suffrage, for the National Association of Colored Women. I was a charter member of the National Association of Colored People, along with my friends Jane Adams, Ida B. Wells. I stood up, I remember, in Washington, D.C., for the first time at a conference of suffragists where none other than Susan B. Anthony was present. I had been attending these meetings for several years after I moved to Washington because as I said, I truly believe that women deserve the right to vote. But on this occasion, Miss Anthony addressed the crowd, which was a full house, and said, those among you who sincerely believe that women should be granted the suffrage, please stand. It took a great deal of courage for me to do so, but I did. I could not have lived with my conscience had I not. It was a very unpopular cause at that time, and not many other women or men rose, 
even though, as I said, the auditorium was filled. Nevertheless, I am always grateful that I have been on the right side of this issue from the very beginning because it enabled me to meet some of the finest, most dedicated, intelligent, and sincere women in this country. Again, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Lucretia Mott, the Quaker, Carrie Chapman Catt. I am glad that I was able to march and picket in front of the White House for women's suffrage, along with my daughters, Phyllis and Mary. I am happy that humbly I was allowed to speak all over the world in Berlin, in Switzerland, in London about peace and women and our race and our desire not to be given a favor, not to be shown undue advantage, but to we knocked at the door of equality and asked only for what is rightfully ours. We were born here in this country. Our African ancestors toiled in fetters for hundreds of years to build it and create it and make it the mightiest nation on earth. We have more than earned the right to equal citizenship. I will never forget when I was in Germany as a young woman, before I met Mr. Terrell, and before I married, I was walking down the street and I glanced up and happened to catch a glimpse of the American flag blowing in the breeze. And I was so taken aback that my eyes filled with tears at the sight of old glory. And I thought to myself, that is my flag and it will protect me here. If anything happens to me, I can go to the consulate and I will be protected. Then a voice in my other ear said, that is more than what the flag would do for you if you were at home. And the thought of all the deprivations, all the prohibitions that my race is subjected to in our native land, that the law allows to take place, the lynching, the segregation, the denial of simple basic citizenship clouded me for a moment and I, I felt a little bitter indeed. But I looked up again at that flag and I said, it is my flag, it is my country. My ancestors created it, built it, suffered and died for it, fought in every single war, all the way back to the Revolutionary War to get so-called freedom from the British for all. It is my country, and though it has mistreated me, I love it, and I will go back home and fight for my rights. I could have stayed in England, or London, England, or Germany, or France, and lived quite peacefully without having to deal with race prejudice, but that was not my fate. That was not my purpose. I knew in my heart my role was to go back and use the education and privilege that I was so graciously given to uplift and uphold my sisters and my people. Now that we have the vote, we would be giving our enemies a bludgeon to knock us out if we didn't use it. Everywhere I go, every speech I give, anytime I see a group of people, I tell them, vote. And tell every woman that you know that she should vote. Many of our people still in the southern states are denied access to the ballot. How foolish it would be for us to not be educated about every single issue that affects our people and vote accordingly. How foolish it would be of us to not write letters, attend meetings, and make sure that the candidates who are running know what our needs and our issues are, because they are many. What good would it have done for us to get our freedom if we were not willing to continue to advocate it for it 
with every breath in our bodies. And so that is why I just addressed the Judiciary Committee of the United States Congress, asking them to support the Equal Rights Amendment. And I'm asking on behalf of my ancestors and my sisters, less fortunate than myself, again, not for special privilege, but for simple American citizenship.